Hi, welcome to the Cinematography Salon podcast, a show about celebrating cinematography and inspiring both the current and next generation of visual artists, exploring the latest trends, techniques, technologies, and culture, and featuring exclusive interviews with some of the most talented and innovative cinematographers working today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Cinematography Salon podcast. My name is Peter Pascucci, and I'm joined by my co-host, Ava Benjamin Shore. Today, we are extremely, extremely excited to spotlight the remarkable career of David Mullen, ASC, a visionary in the field of cinematography. David's passion for the craft was heavily influenced by his unique blend of Japanese heritage and art, his education at Cal Arts, and an emphasis on research and education throughout his career. David's body of work includes titles such as The Marvelous Miss Maisel, in which David just recently won the Emmy for Outstanding Cinematography after five seasons of breathtakingly beautiful and technically brilliant work on the show. Other credits of David's include Westworld, The Love Witch, Jennifer's Body, and many other films. Beyond his achievements in film and television, David has contributed significantly to the field's educational aspect. He has co-authored an updated edition of the classic textbook, Cinematography, with Chris Mokavich, and has written numerous articles for a variety of filmmaking magazines. A member of the American Society of Cinematographers since 2004 and the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences since 2007, Mullen is a respected and influential figure in the cinematography community, and we are so honored to have him on the show. Welcome, David. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. This is a huge episode for us, and I know personally that so many of our listeners are such huge fans of yours, and we were just talking before we started recording about how incredible your Instagram is and the way that you're able to share so much incredible information and depth on there. So we're going to definitely get into that. And we're really excited to touch on some of those posts and some of the education. But uh, I wanted to just start by congratulating you on the Emmy win earlier this year. In your acceptance speech, you emphasized the importance of collaboration, expressing gratitude to your crew and collaborators. And yeah, it was very inspiring to hear you just get up there on stage and thank all the people that made the marvelous Mrs. Maisel happen, such as your Steadicam operator, Jim McConkie, Focus Puller, Anthony Capello, Key Grip, Charlie Sharon, Gaffer, Jenny Scarlata. Additionally, on Instagram and in articles, you've spoken about your work with the costume designer, Donna Zakowska. And just through all of this, it's really clear how much you value the collaborative aspect of cinematography and filmmaking. And it's just been amazing to watch the work in the show. And I'd love if you could just share your thoughts on why it's important to construct an image through both technical and collaborative layers. Well, I think to achieve a certain layer of artistry, you have to sort of up your game by working with better people. I I just think that you reach a certain limit when you start out in low-budget land like I did, where your lighting is pretty good and your artistic concepts are pretty good, but your execution is just limited by time, budget, and the people you're working with. And so to make that next leap forward, you just have to start working with better people on your side, the camera grip and electric side. But then also what's in front of the lens created by the production designer and the costume designer, the cast, all those things so much contribute to the look of a show that, you know, at some point you're only going to look better if they look better. I've always joked that if you did a period film with people in tuxedos and ball gowns in a candlelit room, you'd have to be a pretty bad DP to make that ugly, you know, right? So this, at some point what's visually interesting is actually what's being brought to you as a cinematographer by other people. So it's very important to work with good people, I think. And particularly on Maisel, we do such difficult shots that there's just no way I could achieve the sort of elaborate camera moves we do without a great key grip and dolly grip and operator and focus puller. It's just, the shots are way too complicated. I would never do it myself, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, it was very cool to see some of what you shared with the costuming and how in certain scenes, you know, the set would be grayscale and the costume would be a pop of color. And in other scenes, the set would be very colorful and the costume would be more subdued. And yeah, it makes total sense that so much of this is surrounding yourself and leaning into those collaborations to elevate the cinematography of a project. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I've loved seeing the posts that you've had on your Instagram, breaking down some of those technical shots. It's really amazing to think about all of the planning that goes into those and at just how seamless they all look. Um, yeah. Well, a lot of the planning goes pretty quickly because we sometimes we just get a heads up three days in advance. Other times we have more a week or so in advance warning of what the shot might be. But if it's super ambitious, we get more time, obviously, to work out the kinks in it because on the shooting day, we just don't have hours and hours to figure it out. We'll get it rehearsal days and things like that. 
But a lot of it's just the director's Amy Sherman Palladino describes what she wants and what asks me what could be done. And then I go to Jim McConkey and Charlie Sharon and everyone and say, I'm thinking maybe we could do it like this, but maybe you have a better way because there's so many pros and cons to whether you go movie or steady cam or techno crane or step off a crane with a steady cam. And one way may be good for the first third of the shot, but not work for the last half of the shot. And they'll throw me suggestions and I'll say, well, that won't work for this part. And we'll work out something that kind of works for all of us. And then we go back to Amy and say, this is what we can do. Uh, I think in season three, we began with this big wonder that started out in an airfield of a Jeep driving at us. And we end up in a tight raking two shot of dialogue for a page following the Jeep. And then they get out and we back up on the camera and end up steady camming up onto a stage, seeing hundreds of extras and coming down the other side of the stage. And so the questions were how to do the first half of the shot outside. Do we, I think Jim suggested, why don't we put a movie mount on the Jeep? And I said, if we do that, then we're starting the shot on the two shot. We can't start wider than that. And the moment you disconnect and back up, the rig is going to be in the shot and visual effects have to paint it out. And if the actor's bodies cross it, that won't work. So I said, we got to be somehow detached, but get as close as possible and stay as in sync as possible. So I said, maybe a Russian arm with a movie that we disconnect. And then Charlie, Sharon, and Jim said, no, maybe we should do it in a grip tricks and a steady cam and not do the movie. So that's how we ended up doing it. But we had to get a stunt driver for both the grip tricks and the Jeep as an actor stunt driver. So the two vehicles could end up driving parallel to each other for a page of dialogue without drifting. So, but that's just a lot of discussion and uh, we figured it out. Do you find that your history as a DP that did a lot of independent features, do you think that that has helped you even though you're on something like Maisel, which has a lot more resources and support behind it? Do you still find that things you did 20 years ago have helped you with some of your bigger setups? Yeah, I think um, because we do so much 360 degree shooting, a lot of the lighting has to be either built in with practicals or available light. And then it's with the additional lighting we bring in. So me coming out of independent films and working with minimal lights, I sort of can sort of understand what's the least we need to do to achieve the shot with equipment in terms of rigging and stuff. But the other times you just have to think big. This That's almost my weakness is that I don't think big enough sometimes. I always think, oh, that's going to be too much to do. I I've been on shows where with a co-DP who will suddenly say, let's just silk the entire block. And I'm like, I would never think to ask for that. But, you know, the producer said, okay, you know, I have to sometimes learn to, uh, if I really need it to pull off the shot, to just ask for it. You know, sometimes it is too big. I, We had a fireworks scene outside a lake house in the Catskills and everyone's sitting on the shore of the lake and I needed to put lighting effects coming from the water where the fireworks were going to be put in. And we talked about shipping a lighting barge up to the Catskills and getting out of the lake and somehow getting a condor onto the barge. And the logistics were so ridiculous that at some point I said, okay, let's just park some scissor lifts on the edge of the water and back all the actors up the hill. And, you know, it was too close for comfort. Their feet were literally 10 feet from the base of the scissor lifts, but it was enough to get the shot done. But it just, at some point you just say, it's just crazy to do all that, so... I'm glad you brought that up because I think I spend a lot of time in low budget narrative stuff like shorts or features. And I think I have the same issue when I'm allowed to go bigger. I often don't feel comfortable even going there mentally, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm glad you brought that up because that's something I started thinking about as soon as we started talking about your history, like doing a bunch of independent films. And I was wondering if we could rewind a little bit because I think that there's a lot of interesting anecdotes that both Peter and I have read in other interviews that you've done, both in print and with like the ASC podcast and magazine. And there's one thing that I remember reading, how you studied cinematography for 10 years before you went to film school. And a question I had about that is like, why ultimately did you end up going to film school? What did that provide you that your research could not? Yeah, I... I wanted to get into film school and I couldn't at first. I was a pre-med student and when I tried to transfer from pre-med to film, my grades in chemistry and physics weren't high enough to get into the film school at UCLA. So I, I ended up getting an English Lit degree at UCLA, but making films on the side. And then I 
graduated and I spent four years between college just working and paying off my student loans and making short films on my own and teaching myself film by going to the UCLA libraries. And I actually, I've, I've been to every library in Los Angeles, the AFI library, the Academy library, the USC library. I would just dig up whatever old stuff they had bound periodicals and books and stuff. But I started to shoot a little bit of karaoke video stuff, some short films for other people, but I just didn't know how to advance in a career. You know, I just was independent, making my little Super 8 short films, some 16. And so I said, I I have to go to film school just to have some idea of what's after film school, you know? And I hoped film school would sort of teach me something about a career path, but actually CalArts is not particularly industry-oriented. They see themselves more of an art school than an industry school, other than their animation department is a little more focused that way, but not the live action. Mm -hmm. But what CalArts gave me was contact with people, other students that would lead to work when I graduated. In fact, I did a a short film for Anna Biller while I was at CalArts, and I don't know how many years later, 25 years later, I'm shooting her feature. So it all comes back. You know, Polish brothers, I met them through CalArts Connections. So film school gave me the ability to find work through people. And also, I learned to work with crews. I learned to work with directors. I'd been making my own films as a director and cameraman. I was a one-man band, basically. And so I didn't know how to work with other crew people very well. And it's still a weirdly bone of contention for me. I'm just, I'm a bit of a micromanager, which is drives especially my electric team crazy because I love lighting. I love rigging a light. I love aiming a leak. I love cutting the doors. I love setting flags for the lights. I just, I am so came out of doing all that myself that it's hard for me sometimes to talk through just how I want that balance and how I want that rake on the wall. And sometimes they put up with me and other times they get frustrated with me. So, although I've learned to stop picking up heavy equipment. So. I love what we were talking about just, going back a little bit to this whole idea of like knowing how to scale up and when to scale up and when to use the right tools. And, you know, I think in the case of Maisel, it's like clearly such a huge show and some of these choreographed sequences and this camera work combined with lighting, it's like, just feels so big. And I was curious, was there a point throughout the five seasons where you felt like you really started to embrace some of the resources that you had and the team being more on like a having more of a shorthand or was it always from the pilot like did you have this kind of language of complex movement and choreography from the director like I guess I'm curious throughout the five seasons when you really started to really go for it in terms of some um, of these setups yeah I'd seen some of Amy's stuff on Gilmore Girls uh and I knew I'd been warned that she could be very ambitious with the Steadicam in terms of motion and speed you know really just moving quickly with actors back and forth and through spaces And she warned me on the pilot that she had a sequence in a real apartment in New York where we'd go from the foyer to the living room to the den to the foyer to the living room. We'd go through three or four rooms without a cut. And I had to figure out how to light that on location without, you know, it was a night interior. So I had to figure out how I was going to get lights in the ceiling that weren't going to come into the shot as we backed into each room and things like that. And, you know, worked it out. But when I left after the pilot and I came back when they went to series... I came in on the third episode, which is the fourth. The count of the pilot is one. And then two episodes were shot without me. And then I showed up for episode four. And the first thing Amy said is in the opening credits, she wanted a shot in a montage sequence where the camera at a New Year's Eve party flashback starts in the dining room, goes through the party goers, comes on to Midge and Joel and circles around her. And as it's circling around her, it pulls away and it's daytime in an empty room and Midge is by herself. And she said, I don't want to see the transition. And I was like, what do you mean you don't want to see? I just don't want to see when we actually transition from past to present. And I go, well, there's going to be a transition. I I kept trying to bat my head around that. She didn't want to dissolve. She didn't want to wipe. And I said, well, if it's not a dissolve or wipe, it's got to be a morph. We're morphing between two matching shots. But I said, if you don't want to see things change, I said, you know, we morph on her. Her hair is going to change. No, I don't want to see that. Okay, when we morph on her costume from the party is going to morph into the costume in the moving day. She goes, no, I don't want to see that. I said, it's going to morph from night to day. And she's like, no, I don't want to see that. So I was like, okay, well, the moment we morph has to be her back has to be to camera. So we don't see her hair change on her face. 
Her party clothes and her moving day clothes have to be similar enough that we don't see sleeves appear and disappear. And Donna had to redesign the dress, actually, so that there were sleeves on it. All the furniture that's going to be gone in the second half has to be gone in that party scene. So we land on her, we end up on the fireplace mantle where there's no furniture in the frame and no party goers so that you don't see a lampshade disappear. You don't see a couch disappear. You don't see a party goer disappear. So that moment it happens, it's only a few frames, but nothing changes. So that as we pass around her, it's now we reveal it's daytime. There's a daytime window and we circle one more time. We pull away. And it's an empty room. So it's quite tricky and the visual effects had to do a lot of fixing of perspective and because we couldn't motion control this we had to do it steady cam so leslie uh foster robson our visual effects supervisor asked us to shoot the a and b half of that flashback on the same day she didn't want us to come back two days later after we've cleared the apartment so our department had to dress the place for the party we shot the first part we broke for lunch they emptied out the apartment and dress, and uh, we came back after lunch, and I lit it for day. And then Jim McConkey had to play the previous take on his Steadicam sled as an overlay, so he would practice going around Midge and lining up the previous take as best he could. So the mantle going behind her back was all lined up in the fireplace and her headroom, and and I gave them some extra room for stabilization and shifting around by framing for a crop in. So instead of our normal. 3.2K, I, I framed for 2.8K on the Alexa and gave effects like a 15% extra space to move the frame around. And they lined everything up, but they had to take bits and pieces of wall and things and kind of shift them between the two versions to get it line up perfectly. But when you see it, it goes by so quickly, it is like magic. You know, you just circle her and then you pull away and it's like day and you go like, when did that happen? It's just, it's so effortless. And that was the first thing I came back to after doing the pilot. And that same episode, near the end, there's a montage where Midge and Susie go out partying to different clubs to see different comedy acts, and they end up at the Copacabana. And we start out on the drummer, and we pull back over the heads of the dancers in the nightclub, and then we follow a waiter through the tables and into a kitchen. And so we had to do that with a technocrane with a movie on a magnet, which is the first time we ever did that, where we pulled back on a technocrane, disconnected, then walked the movie through. And that's something that Larry McConkey had built this electromagnet and worked it out in his garage and gotten it all to work. But I also remember that night is that it was such a complicated move and Jim wanted motivation for every move because Amy wanted to end up back on the dancers for a beat and then another way to take us back to the door. And some of the timing, we did number takes because we'd pan over and the waiter to take us back would be a beat late. And then he'd take us to the next waiter who'd also be beat too early. And after that, Amy said, I want dancers as extras. So whenever we had these complicated moves where the timing of the extra crosses was critical, she would bring a choreographer, Marguerite, and dancers to play the extras so they knew how to come into frame right at the right moment and leave the frame at the right moment. So that's something we learned on that shot. Wow. And that technique of dancers as extras, I'm sure, carried through all the way to the end, I imagine, right? Because I remember hearing, too, that, that Amy herself has a dance background. and Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, she thinks in terms of dance and moving actors to the camera. She's very adamant that the camera move with the actors and not she's not so interested in unmotivated moves. Um, I mean, sometimes we have to pull away or something, but she generally is happier when we move with an actor. When they stop, the camera stops, and when they move again, the camera moves again, which is tricky. We did in season two, we opened with that switchboard, shot where we we start on the department store first floor and we end up going through a mail slot and down to the basement and into a switchboard room and amy had choreographed with the choreographer all the moving around of midge getting from chair to chair she moves from station to station in her rolling chair and amy was very concerned that we wouldn't keep up with midge she goes the minute midge rolls her chair the camera has to move with her and stop with her and i was like you know, we thought, well, do we need to do this with some sort of cable cam? And that wasn't going to work because we were going to have to cut the whole ceiling off and replace it in post. And I didn't want to do that. So I was able to convince Amy that because once we saw the set built, it was much tighter than we realized. There wasn't much room. And so I said, she's going to kick that chair and roll like six feet across the room. But Jim said, if I lean forward on the movie and the moment she kicks the chair, I yank back with it. I can keep up with her uh, speed. It certainly was easier if we um, were chasing rather than following, 
you know, and as we landed on Midge in her chair, the question is, do we stay on her back? And when she kicks the chair, we have to back up quickly with her, or do we wrap around her and end up, and when she kicks the chair, we chase her, which is what we ended up doing, which is actually easier because the actor isn't kicking right at you. They're kicking away from you. So, you know, they're not going to hit your lens. But it was still very hard to work out because Midge needed something to kick off of. So we kept trying to build something in her, around her feet, a file cabinet, something that her feet could push off of. But that same thing was always in the way of the Movi operator. You know, he tried to circle as wide as he could around her, but he kept hitting the file cabinet or hitting this. And, and it was always like, well, we shove that back, then she won't have it to push off of. And so it was a very constrained uh, space to deal with. One more question, and then I'm eager to move on to sort of going back to some of the history of things. But I'm curious, it seems like there's so many different tools for all these different camera movements and all these different choreographed scenes with, like you said, hundreds of extras and tons of very dynamic movement and transitions. And I remember seeing when the Movi like first came out, like I remember there was this like, I think it was released by Movi, it was like a rollerblader going through Manhattan and passing a movie through the back of a taxi cab or something. But I was curious, uh, just given that you're someone who has tracked the technological advancements so closely and implemented them in such elegant and artistic ways in your work, like, can you talk just a little bit about the advent of the gimbal and the movie and how you kind of use it in different scenarios and how maybe it differs from like a steady cam or maybe using both, or like you said, the magnet on the technocrane and all these very interesting approaches. I'm just curious to hear you talk a little bit about that tool and how it's helped you capture um, the show so well. Yeah. The problem is that it's always been easy to move a little camera, like a tiny GoPro or something like that, if you can stabilize it in a way. It's just that when you start wanting to work with a better quality camera, like an Alexa, that's been the challenge over the years is the high end cinema cameras getting small enough that they're mobile enough to use on movies and things rather than being forced to sort of go down to a DSLR or, or something that has its own issues. But, you know, there was that show, um, Southland, I think uh, was, that did all the great camera work with mirrorless cameras, you know, where they would just hand off into a car and go through a window and keep going, running down the street with it and stuff like that. And they were mixing all sorts of formats and cameras. But Maisel isn't a show where we could justify big switches and technical quality. So I'm, I try to stick to the Alexa whenever I can. We've only used other cameras, like on some drone shots, and we use this new DJI Ronin, uh, I forget what it's called, the 4D. 4D. Yeah. yeah, for that taxi cab sequence. But um, over the time of using the Movi, I've seen sort of the pros and cons of it. And there's many times where We've talked about a movie, and I've said, you know, if we could do this with a steady cam, I think Amy will be happier. Because the trouble is, when you start getting a technocrane move and a movie disconnect, that camera move is created by three or four people. You have to have the timing of the guy extending the arm of the crane and the eye swinging the arm of the crane, and then the guy grabbing the movie and walking with it. And usually it's a two man job, so Jim's operating at the wheels and someone else is hand-holding the movie, and the two of them are on headset trying to coordinate when do I pan right and when do I swing right. And so sometimes with movie moves, you see a certain amount of back panning where the camera's moving around, but the two operators are not quite in sync, so the camera's doing this little side-to-side -side correction as the two operators are fighting each other. So I see that in movie shots, and when Amy wants to adjust a shot, it's so much easier if it's a steady cam move because she just goes to Jim and adjusts Jim and says, I need you to move a beat later here or this or that. When she says the same thing on a techno movie shot, I have to figure out which person has got to make the adjustment. And so it's a lot more difficult to me. You know, we had a shot in season four where the camera moved up onto a burlesque stage from the audience and into a window of a, uh, it looked like a dollhouse set. It was, we called it the rear window number, but it was a burlesque number with four rooms of a set on stage and the camera goes through the first room tiny room and does a 180 spin then rises up to the second floor then tracks through the second floor comes down to the first floor again goes into that room and spins 180 degrees and then backs up and lands wide one more time and so we talked about do we fly up on a technocrane and disconnect but i said we do that the moment we spin 180 we got a technocrane in the audience that then the visual effects has to paint in an audience and i said if unless we're going to fly up to the second floor i'd just rather not do that and have that much visual effects to be done to the shot. So I asked Charlie Sharon, is there a way we could put a crane 
base behind the set for Jim to step backwards onto as a Steadicam operator? And then can you track him on that crane across the set? Can you put the GF crane on track and dolly him across the second floor and then lower him back down and he steps off? And Charlie Sharon was able to make room for a crane behind the stage, although he had to chainsaw part of our set away to make room for this weight bucket. And then at the very end of the move, the weight bucket ended up in the shot. We couldn't track it completely off the other side either, so visual effects had to paint out the crane base out of the background as we spun around and backed away again at the very end. So ultimately, the amount of effects work was much less than if we had gone with a technocrane shot where we had half the audience missing when we spun around and looked the other way. And that's one of those shots where Amy describes something, and, and first it's like, is this a one musical number or is this one shot as part of a whole number and we choreographed and we did a rehearsal with how we thought we'd do it with the steady cam with the music playing and it timed out to be a minute long shot with a minute long piece of music so i was like okay it's a it's a wonder there's no reason to have additional coverage because we got through the whole song in this one move but one thing i'd said to amy so when you go into the set and you spin around you're seeing the back side of the set so you're going to see grip equipment you're going to see scaffolding you're going to see the back of the stage and lighting and she goes no i don't really i want it to look pretty both ways and i was like okay so i had to go to don holder who was doing our theatrical lighting and i said she doesn't want to see a lot of the gear when we spin around backstage so you have to hide it or incorporate it into the set and we have to dress the back side of the set so it looks nice both directions and things like that so there was a little bit of magic realism, you know, rather than going in backstage and seeing the inner workings of a theater, it's just all beautifully dressed and cleaned up even from the reverse side. So, But that's, again, talking through with Amy what we're going to see beat by beat before we do it so we are prepared to fix things or change things. Yeah, I'd love to ask a follow-up question to what you were just talking about. It sounds like in the show you're constantly pushing the bounds of what people might think is possible. And I think that on a lot of different scales, you can run into this feeling of a director or showrunner asking you something and you go, is that possible? Can I do it? And I think like, have you over time mentally found ways to be open-minded to things that seem impossible And like, I guess another question would be like, how do you handle the stress of being the problem solver? Like being given something that is so demanding and unusual that I think that's a lot on your shoulders. Yeah, it is stressful. And we do very complicated shots that aren't planned, you know, where it's just a rehearsal in a space and it turns into a big complicated one or on the day of. And then it's like, I have to figure out how I'm going to light it and do all that in our normal schedule. But the advantage of working on this show is that Amy or Dan will do these complicated shots, but they don't cover after that. They're literally, if you do something difficult, they're going to use it. They're not going to then chop it into 30 other angles. You know, I've, I remember even as a student, I remember going to an ASC clubhouse conversation with Isidore Mankowski. And he said, I'm doing a TV movie where in an office, we, with windows, we had this complicated 360 degree master that, did everyone's lines and I had to deal with glass reflections and fill and contrast. And then the director went and covered every person in the room separately. And I'm like, what was the point of the 360? You, you know, you've done all this. The lighting, I'm sure, is compromised to make this work. But then now, you know, I've run into that thing where you've, you light it as best you can, considering you have to hide all the lights from camera and you can only key from overhead and all these things. And then you start covering it and you have to match that lighting. Otherwise, you know, it's going to look odd if they use the wider shot and your closer shot. And now you're keen from a different direction. So now you're stuck matching yourself and you never were that happy with the lighting in the first place. So that's, it's tough when you know the director is going to chop up a shot. But in our case, we don't chop up the shot. We, you know, if we do cut it, it makes sense. Like we did a, a one in this Cuban nightclub where Midge and Lenny dance. Uh, we were copying I Am Cuba for the first minute of the shot. And then the second half of the shot, we were in a new territory going through dancers and landing on Midge and Lenny talking, and they get up and dance. And it was originally all one shot, but because it was fairly wide angle to match I Am Cuba, like a 21 mil, they use an 18 mil. We landed in a two shot, but afterwards Amy said, I need two singles. It's too intimate a moment 
to just play it in a loose two shot. You have to, I need a single image, single Lenny, and then we'll go back to the master. So it became a three shot scene rather than a single shot scene. It made sense. The only issue was that we had been cueing all these lights with the music manually. I just picked a tempo with the dimmer board operator and I said, you know, we did first take out, cue the color changes and afterwards I said, just go with that beat. And so we'd go pink, blue, pink, blue, and, and then yellow. And, and then suddenly she said, we're going to cover this. And I'm like, what color were we on when Midge said her line? And what color were we on when Lenny said his line? So we, I said, you have to pick a take that we're matching to because I have to play it back and figure out. And when she said, it's going to probably take seven, I think. And then so I looked at take seven. And just as she started talking, it was switching from pink to cyan. And that's what I matched to. And it worked fine. But if it was a typical show where you chop up the shot, it is very frustrating because you beat yourself up. You know, and the other is you get the sense that the complicated shot isn't really worth doing. You know, like I've had really ambitious directors on some shows design these shots that I'm like, this scene isn't about, you know, like uh, I remember a scene I, I did in another show where a character just goes from the elevator through a door and up to a desk and finds something in the desk. And the director came in with a 60 shot list where they wanted to pull the ceiling of the set so we could technocrane from the elevator all the way to the desk. Then she wanted to track through glass, all the glass and follow the character up to the desk. And then steady cam from the elevator to the desk and then chase the steady cam from the elevator to the desk. And then the scene was about what he finds at the desk and all the stuff. 60 setups to just cross 20 feet of a room. And and then we had, I had to shoot later. Uh, I didn't end up shooting the scene because it got reassigned, but I ended up shooting all the inserts of him opening the desk and finding everything in the desk. And, and in, in post, they decided, let's just make it a mystery. He comes out of the goes in the room, we cut, and later we'll find out what he found. So they, they used two shots. I think the director ended up shooting like 20 setups for that scene, and I ended up shooting an additional 10 inserts. But in the final edit, there's three cuts and that's where you feel like, why are we beating ourselves up? So I, I do like, you know, with Dan and Amy, the shot means something. They're the writers, the directors, and the showrunners. So it's going to be in there. If you're going to beat yourself to do it, it's going to be in there and it's worth it. So I think it's a, that's why it's a good experience for me. I remember hearing you say too that you were inspired hearing, I forget who it was exactly, but someone saying that every time you move the camera, you sacrifice lighting. And just as a concept and how it starts to make you think about what is the purpose of the movement? Is that what's carrying the emotion of the scene or is it the lighting that's carrying the emotion and how that varies so much from scene to scene or script to script? And I don't know, I thought and that some, was really that was, I was so. quoting, um, I was quoting uh, John Bailey and he said that moving the camera weakens the lighting and the composition, but it may be adding something to the scene that makes it worth what you're sacrificing at that end. So if the movement is creating something you can't get any other way emotionally or dramatically, then it's worth how you're compromising the other two elements, the composition and lighting. So that's something I try to keep in mind. Movement can add a lot to a sequence. So it's definitely worth the effort. And uh, one of the things that the reason Amy hired me is that she said, you're not going to be too precious about the lighting because she just, she wants the camera to move and she doesn't want every shot to be like a Vermeer painting or something like that. She wants, you know, I try to sneak it in when I can, but it's just, for her, it's about energy and movement and tempo and speed and everything. So Now, occasionally, I do get some lock-off shots on our show, and I, I go to town on those because I can perfectly frame and light. And, you know, we have some joke shots, not joke shots, but sometimes the humor is in this kind of static frame, you know, a little surreal kind of moment. Uh, and that's nice when I get those sort of things where I can just compose a nice wide shot. The only thing I miss on the show is we don't do close-ups. Our close-ups are waist up. Sometimes they get as tight as belly button up, but I don't do any classical close-ups on the show and for five years now. So it's, uh, I do kind of miss that. I, you know, I think close-ups are overused, but I do think there's also a history and art to close-ups in cinema. And I would like to do some now and then, but, but I understand the advantage of staying loose because our show is so much about ensemble and setting people are in relation with other people in relation to their setting. It's uh, very classical in that way. Yeah, I remember hearing you mention that you pretty much live on the, I think it was like the 28 millimeter Primo or maybe the 24, but yeah, it definitely has such a nice look to it and it's so dynamic and just draws you right in. It's beautiful. 
So David, it's been so fascinating to hear you talk about receiving some of this direction from Amy and having to sort of digest it. And then of course, prepare for what you need to execute with your team. And, you know, it was interesting hearing you talk about some advice that you received from Alan Daviau, ASC, about shooting your first feature and the advice given to you involved knowing your first week of production backwards and forwards. And you said that it taught you how to be hyper prepared. And I think this is something that so many people, I'm sure who listen to the show are like, wonder about going into a longer form project, how to feel really confident walking into that project and how to make sure that they're doing everything that they can to be able to execute the director's vision. And I just think that you've given us so many examples of how prep can help execute some of these complicated scenes. And I'd love to just hear about what your take is on prep and the importance of it and what it means to be hyper prepared. That advice is really useful on features because usually a feature, you know, back then for me, it was a three, four week thing, maybe five weeks. But I discovered over time, as Alan was right, is that if you know your first week really well, like over well, like, you know, where you're going to be every moment of the day and what the setup is going to be, you have some freedom in the second week, third week to be looser because you can gauge the speed of the crew. You can find the style of the film as you're shooting the first week's work. And so the second week, you're saying, well, this is how we tend to shoot this or how we should shoot this. So the preparation lets you be more free to improvise by the second week. But what's nice about the first week, especially the first three days of being super prepared, is that you tend to be on schedule. The crew sees that you know what you're doing and they're going to work efficiently that you're not just making it up as you go. So it sets the right tone for everyone else on the set when you know what you're going to do and where the camera's going to point and any of that stuff. Everyone's sort of prepared for the setups and stuff. So I think it just sets the right tone for the scene. On a TV series, it gets a lot harder because there's just so many pages and so many weeks and months of shooting. You cannot possibly be prepped for seven months of shooting in advance. So... You know, that's why you alternate DPs for one reason. They say one DP is preparing for his episode or her episode. But it's you prepare what needs to be prepared, basically. You look at the script and you just say, well, these dialogue scenes in this office or in the apartment, that's going to be a block and shoot and figure out on the day and we'll pre-rig the sets or whatever. But this scene really should be broken down into a shot list or at least or storyboard or some video rehearsals of it or something like that. In the last season of Maisel, we did this big double technocrane one from the office that ended up in the studio. That was one where Amy came to me and said, I want to follow Susie from the ground floor to the second floor of the office and chase Mike around the office and come down the outer steps into this TV studio. So we figured out we need a technocrane outside the studio to come down the stairs. We need a technocrane in the office to go up to the second floor. We'd have to disconnect with a movie. And she wasn't going to try to see if it worked on the day because I said, uh, you know, it was complicated. I said, she said, we should see a rehearsal in advance. So we did a blocking rehearsal with stand-ins. We did it again with cast. We did it after work, basically. We did a rehearsal of the move. And we finally got it like 80% there because it's pretty difficult with the handoffs. Amy said, that's great. We get all the way end of the scene where they get to the base of the stairs. Could we not cut? Can we just keep going and go into the next set and do the scene where everyone arrives for the show as a one -er? And there, and I was like, um, that was just on the movie straight with no crane or anything. I said, that's doable, except our movie operator is stuck on the second floor of the office set, and we just left her behind, Nick Nas, and Technocrane down to the first floor. So we had to bring in another operator, Jeff Mulstock, to come in to take over the movie the second time. And then he had to then do it all the one or in the next space, which was another page of dialogue. So, But once she said it, I was like, yeah, that's a great idea because it was doable. It's a TV studio set. It's got hundreds of lights in the ceiling. It's not like I've lit it a million times for audience and stage and the band, and it's all pre-lit to some degree. So doing a one in there was not that difficult lighting-wise, and it made sense there's no real reason to cut if we didn't have to. We get to the stairs and just keep following Mike Carr over to uh, Gordon Ford and then into the room. So it wasn't a shot that didn't make sense to me. You know, it wasn't like, why are we keep going when, you know, I've had moments where we've done a complicated shot, but we know we have to cut to something at some point because it's written that we cut to this. I go, we're beating ourselves and we know there's a cut point here. We should just carry the shot as far as that cut point because otherwise, you know, and sometimes 
Amy will agree with me on that. But other times she likes to play things without cuts because of the actors, not because of the technology. We've had scenes where we had a 12-page scene in the apartment where she, we had, I think, four cameras that day because she wanted a stage of camera in each room of the apartment. So the steady cam would follow them up and down the hallways. And every time someone went to the kitchen, B camera would wait for them in the kitchen and do the kitchen portion. They left the kitchen, the steady cam would pick them up again, take them to the bedroom. C camera would be waiting in the bedroom and carry the dialogue in the bedroom. Then they leave and the steady cam pick them up again and take them to a closet. And D camera was waiting in the closet for one more angle. And we did 12 pages in half a day, basically, with that approach. And we ended up, once we were stuck in the hall at the very end, then we had two angles of coverage in the steady cam because we ended up over one shoulder. We had to do a clean single and then a reverse two shots so that. So it became three setups for the whole day. But the first setup was four cameras in different rooms. And I actually enjoy those shots because it's hard to light a multi-camera shot in one room. Like when you're doing, you run three cameras in a dining room or, or living room, and you're trying to make everyone look good and the cameras are all pointed at each other. But when each camera is in a different room, you get to light each room individually. So it's like this actor can walk into a nice key light in the bedroom and then he leaves and walks into a nice key light in the kitchen. It's just, I'm not trying to look in multiple directions at the same time. So it's an interesting way to work, but it's mainly so the actors can play the whole scene from head to toe without a break. And they have to come prepared. There's the stress for them to, to know that they're not going to chop up the scene, that they've got to do 12 pages of dialogue without stopping. So. But that's the nature of our show, is that everyone shows up on set knowing the whole day's worth of dialogue, and uh, yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's all starting to make so much sense why it's so important to like have that trust that they will use those takes in full. You know, I think that that's such an interesting insight talking to you about this, is how it can be, I guess, so disheartening, like exactly what you were talking about, where then all of a sudden you have all this coverage, and it kind of undermines what this brilliant execution that's happened. And it's just so cool that you guys develop that relationship where these wonders will play just as is. It's so fascinating. But it, it, the burden is on the wonder actually being a good wonder. It's not about showing off that you're doing the scene in one shot. It's got to work as a shot. It's got to work emotionally. And for them, the humor, the jokes have to land in that one shot, the staging. So if it doesn't work, they'll cover it like anyone else. They'll say, oh, I'm not getting the funny moment I want. I actually need a reaction of this person or I need to cut to that line or something like that. So they're thinking all the time about how it's going to play. Hi, we are excited to announce our partnership with Laua Lenses by Venus Optics. Laua has had a long history of providing cinematographers with unique and state-of-the-art lens options, including their recent Proteus 2x Anamorphic series, which remains the most accessible T2.0 option in the market for professional production. A big thank you to Sandus for helping support our show as well as part of their relentless reliability campaign. The extreme portable solid state drive has become an essential on film sets and a personal favorite of mine for how durable, reliable, and fast it is. Sandus leads in drive and memory card technology, emphasizing not just storage, but everything worth keeping. We'd also like to thank our partner at Fujifilm. We're very grateful to them for supporting not just the podcast, but a lot of what we do at the Cinematography Salon. And with the release of their latest camera, GFX 100 the second, they release a tool that opens up new creative possibilities. It's brands like these that remind us why we do what we do. It's more than just support. It's about being part of a community that values every shot and every story. So David, I wanted to go back to some of the education because I think you have so much insight when it comes to that. And something that I've just been thinking about is personally, I find it fun and fascinating to read about the first hundred years of filmmaking and cinematography. And my question for you is, does learning about the first hundred years of our craft, does it offer something different that you can't find, say, in like a podcast that had come out in the past few years or a current issue of the ASC magazine? It's a very good question. Is it practical? Is there any practical reason to learn the, about the past? Should one learn about film if you're shooting only digital, for example? Or should painters who are painting in oils learn about frescoes and other ma material? I Part of it's just intellectual curiosity. Richard Crudo once said to me, every DP likes to peel different layers of the onion back. Some people like to get way down into the micro level of knowledge on the process. And I'm not quite there yet. I'm not at the uh, pixel level kind of person, but there are other great DPs who, are, who seem very uninterested in most of the technical side of it. Although I suspect someone like Conrad Hall, who always sort of acted like he didn't want to really know about, you know, oh, 
give me that big lamp, whatever that is. You know, he, he actually really knew what he was doing technically, but he didn't like to dwell on that so much. I think it's you know, this is intellectual curiosity. It's also just respect for the past. I just, I feel like there's a lot of emotion and blood, sweat and tears went into these classic movies. And these people had careers that went a certain time and they had highs and lows in their careers. And, and I feel like it's nice to remember them, remember their work and remember them as people you know, and what they went through, how they learned and how they evolved as cinematographers and what changes they had to deal with as sound came along and color came along and widescreen came along. Maybe it's selfish because they're thinking like, if I'm taking the time to learn about these people of the past, like George Barnes or Arthur Edison or Charlie Lang, someone 50 years from now will take the time to learn about me, maybe. I don't know. So it's just, maybe there's an aspect to that. But, uh, I do find these stories of these people, the past human stories, to be interesting. I do also feel like I'm looking for inspiration outside the box, you know, like I, everyone tends to be inspired by the same things at the same time. And the downside is you end up with 50 projects that look vaguely similar. And I feel like if I could find inspiration, some 1930s film, maybe I'll have a slightly unique look or I will what's old will seem new again kind of idea but so there's probably an aspect of that but mainly it's just the love of cinema the magical moments that happen in movies seem kind of universal when it's just this perfect moment of music and light and emotion whether it's a 1940s film or a 1990s film or a film this year you know it tends to be almost universal yeah and i found that with older films and i think ones that maybe aren't on whatever like film critics top 100 there's like a lot of innovation and modernity to be found in i don't know like you've posted about like cleopatra or moulin rouge and like the colors and like the color gels that those dps were using are so modern it is shocking to look at because i that's something that i don't really associate with filmmaking from that era or it's just maybe i haven't seen enough of those films and it kind of or if you watch a silent movie and the type of or like Gone with the Wind or something that yeah. really has incredible camera movement, you realize that <laughs> a lot of the things that we think are like mind blowing now have kind of been done already. Maybe it's just kind of new to you, but it is really inspiring to look at things that yeah. aren't often seen so much and you go, oh, my God, this is so modern and so incredible. And it is actually a little shocking to think of how they did that with that technology. Yeah, it was a slow film and slow lenses and big lights. And I was watching a film, I think it was Written on the Wind, as Russell Meddy, I think. Whole hard lit, you know, very shadowy, contrasty, not a modern style at all. But there was one shot where um, Lauren Bacall goes up to talk to someone in bed, stands next to a lampshade, and she it's supposed to be moody, so she's just backlit by the hallway light or something, mostly, even though they've added more light than that. It, they've created the effect that the room lights are off and she's backlit from the other room. So she's standing near a wall. Her face is near a wall and a lamp that's off, actually. And in the wide shot, her face is dark because she's got her back to the light source. When he cut to her close-up, Basically, he just lit her with the bounce off the wall coming back in her face, which is a completely modern way to do it. She's just got a little faint, soft bounce back that's filling in her face a little bit, and she's got this strong backlight or kicker. And I was like, out in the film, it just sticks out because the rest of the film is fairly theatrically lit with colored and hard light, but this moment seems very modern. You know, this is, it's natural. She's her back facing a wall. There's no light source on her face, so he creates one just by saying, well, it's like hitting the lampshade bouncing back into her face. And he, I'm sure he did it by adding a, something and bouncing into it or diffusing a light or something. But it just looks very natural and it's unique in that film. And I see that in older movies all the time. Sometimes it's just pure accent. They couldn't light it traditionally. So they had to do something unconventional like bring in a bed sheet or reflect something. There's a great story that I think it was James Wong Howe tells about doing Air Force for Howard Hawks, where they were shooting a scene where a bomber lands after the airfield had been bombed during Pearl Harbor at Hickman Airfield. And this plane lands and this guy gets out and says, what happened here? And they lit the foreground where the plane lands uh, for the actor to come out. 
But the whole field was lit with some carbon arcs, and it was supposed to be a magic hour shot. And right before the plane's circling to land, the generator goes out that's powering all the other carbon arcs, and only the generator working in the foreground is running. And they have to shoot before it gets dark, and the plane is circling, and Howard Hawks is saying, what are we going to do? And James Wong House said, get me a bunch of military flares. He pulled the carbons out of all the carbon arcs, and he jammed as many military flares as he could into the hole. And right before the camera rolled, he had them light all the flares at once. And so all the carbon arcs acted as big reflector dishes for these military flares. So they were bright, but they were sputtering horribly and putting out all the smoke. And so suddenly this airfield is just covered in flashing, flickering, smoky light, which works because it's a scene that the field had just been bombed. And then the plane lands through the smoke and pulls up into normal lighting in the foreground. But Howard Hawks like, wow, let's just do the whole movie with road flares and stuff. We don't, you know, what do we need lights for? Um, but it was just one of those kind of brilliant improvisational moments, you know. Oh my God. That's incredible. Unbelievable. <laughs> Such an incredible story. You touched a little bit on some of the low ASA film stocks and pairing that with soft lighting. And I heard you talk a little bit of that in a post as well. And I found it really compelling and I kind of wanted to dig into it a little bit more, but you have all these unique and beautiful ways of describing the looks of different films as from history and modern day. And one post that I thought was particularly interesting was how you achieved this sort of monochromatic look for the film Norfolk. And you compare the process of that to painting, describing how one way to achieve sort of a desaturated image is by hazing it and how that's akin to mixing white paint into all your colors as a painter or through the sober retention film process, how mixing that would be akin to mixing black paint into all your colors. And I just think like, this is something that I think is so different about the past. And now is the sensitivity of film or the digital sensory before working with 50 ASA. Or um, I even think of, you know, you've shared some beautiful images from your childhood of like slide film taken by your dad and things like that. And it's like that very low ISO film and the way that it's so enduring and has such richness to it and you described it as silky i'd love to hear you talk a little bit about what you've noticed about some of those older stocks and how they react with soft light and what about that interests you i particularly love uh the 1970s era when a hundred speed film first came along in 1968 and you suddenly for a lot of dps that was a revelation they could actually shoot in more reasonable light levels that with regular light bulbs and fixtures and smaller units but not enough to shoot with zero lighting to some degree unless they were like barry linden in the super fast lens but they could mix some available light and lit scenes and i love that look because it's um they learn to light naturally with slower film mixing with natural light scenes so they had to match to some degree so they're starting to mimic real life sources but still get it up to a level that the lens and the film stock can handle and so there's a certain richness from creating soft light as opposed to just capturing it naturally there's more contrast to some degree but i look at what storaro did in the 70s or gordon willis and his single source soft units but artificially lit but lit to look natural but there's a kind of sculptural quality to it because it isn't, you know, today the cameras are so sensitive, we can just shoot in actual available light. And sometimes the contrast gets very flattened because we just have so much light sources everywhere coming at us, um, filling in the shadows. And the other is a digital is flatter in the shadows. So it picks up detail in the shadows that film didn't. My glib way of putting it, it was always that digital is flatten the shadows and contrasting the highlights, and film is flatten the highlights and contrasting the shadows. So if you want to make digital look more like film, you got to kind of reverse the curve to some degree and go very loggy in the highlights and very crushy in the shadow end, and it starts to feel the more like film. At least film printed, you know, film negative scan can be very flat too, just like digital. But film that was printed and projected in a theatrical print, that's where you lost a lot of shadow detail because the print stock had to have a certain contrast in it to give you good blacks on the screen. And even today, you see that if you see like the IMAX prints of Oppenheimer, it's very contrasty. The shadows are very dark. It's a very rich look because that's just the blacks of print stock. And cinematographers kind of lit knowing when the things would fall to black. You know, they would do their tests and then they would say, okay, the shadow is going to go black at four to five under and but with digital, it tends to keep seeing, and you can use that detail in digital because with film, even if it's on the negative, it's very grainy. So 
there's detail in the black sweater here, but on film, if you try to bring up that detail, it just gets crawling with noise. Whereas in digital, there's much lower noise floor. So you can pull up that detail and still use it. But the downside is then you tend to flatten out your image a bit. And that seems to be a common question I get. A lot of students say, how do I get good blacks in digital? Because they're tending to try to fix their shot by lifting shadow detail. And it's like, you can make your blacks perfectly black and digital. You just set the dial and the color corrector so black is zero, and then it's black. But that's not the problem. The problem isn't technically getting black. The problem is they want natural shadow detail with good blacks. And to to that, you have to light for the amount of shadow detail you want. You just can't keep lifting it the below end up every time you think I need to see something in the shadows. You actually have to put some light in the shadows if you want to see there. So, and then you can keep your black level down to a normal level. And to some degree also that question I think comes out of people working with low-end consumer cameras that are doing a certain amount of auto gain adjustments. So every time they go into low light, they're suddenly much higher in ISO in the shadows than they, they were before and they get very noisy shadows. So, um, I think such a great example of this that I came across too, looking at your page, was that shot in Westworld of the sunset and how you used a very long lens to capture the actual like sphere of the sun and um and, and you didn't have your spot meter you didn't have your spot meter and you were like yeah. people don't realize like you can underexpose this by however six stops and for a shot like that where you have where you're relying only on the blacks of the silhouette there's just so much room to kind of bring everything down in the exposure and i just thought that yeah that shot was so breathtaking and it's a testament to i think what you're talking about a bit where you can decide where your exposure lies yeah i think um it's just like when you're shooting fire, you almost can't underexpose fire enough. The more you underexpose fire, just the redder it gets. You look at Gone with the Wind and the Burning of Atlanta, and that's those silhouettes against the big wall of fire. This is like 10 ASA film, 2.8 lens, 10 ASA, but the fire is beautifully rendered. It's just it's un- exposed to the point where it's a deep red color instead of a bright white color. But they're not trying to get shadow detail. It's just a pure silhouette against that, so they can just expose for the fire. It's the same with shooting the setting sun. The more I underexpose it, the more orange and red the sun ball gets. I, the shadows are just silhouette, so they're just getting blacker and blacker. I mean, I'm sure there's a point where I could underexpose it too much, but you have a lot of range, especially with film, and its highlight detail is so strong that as long as you're within a range that that sun ball has got color in it and not gone burned out white, you then can bring it up and down further in post. So it's... Uh, I basically metered it by just pointing my digital still camera at the sunset and saying, well, my still camera would shoot this at, you know, 50 ASA at F22 or whatever it was, you know, and I just put some NDs in the camera and shot it. It's also an interesting lesson in terms of when to use spot meter versus incident and everything. Like, I think that that specific scenario of needing the spot meter, I guess, in a technical sense to just be able to look directly at the sky when incident is kind of relevant in that scenario is very interesting. And Normally, I'm not a spot meter person. I'm someone who always uses an incident meter in film. But whenever you have to expose for self-illuminating objects, you know, a sunball, a lampshade, a TV, anything that's creating its own light, either you need a reflective meter or sometimes you could put your dome right up to the source and say, well, if, if there was a human face right leaning against that lampshade and I expose for that face, I know the shade itself also will be exposed more or less in that same range. I could see it with my own eyes. So you can do guesses like that sometimes with an incident meter. But David, I think that, you know, if we could talk about The Love Witch a little bit, I think that's a really interesting film in your filmography that kind of unites your love of history and the techniques that they used in the ability to tell a story. And you shot that in 2016. And I, I think that film has like such a unique look like there's nothing that looks like that movie and i just know that so many people go crazy over that film because of how special it looks to me it's almost like the film exists as like a bridge between how films were shot decades ago and modern day cinematography so i guess i was wondering stylistically or technically are there any things from that older era of cinematography that you still wish were common practice, given that you kind of know the ins and outs of how things were shot from then, that time? I certainly think it's good to know how to light for slow film and high ASAs. We, the slowest film we could find was 200-speed 
Kodak. And so I rated it 100 ASA. And I wanted to get it to eight just in general. So the old rule is that's 100 foot candles to get a two eight at 100 ASA. So every shot had to be lit to 100 foot candles. And uh, just once I started getting into the rhythm of that, I just sort of became the same units because we're doing a kind of classical hard key light. And so it got to be like if the key light was four feet away, it could be a tweeny. But if it was six feet away, it had to be a 1K just to get a two eight, you know, and then I would top it and bottom it and flag it and do all the things they used to do like shadow the top of the forehead and shadow the neck and then fill in the eyes and either do a high frontal or high three-quarter keys um you know the fact we were shooting on film and going to finish on film meant that i couldn't fix anything in post other than just standard photochemical correcting at first i was a little nervous about that but i it, it seemed to film was pretty consistent and i didn't have any issues i just exposed everything really well so it wasn't like uh if anything i over over exposed it because i was rating it a stop over and then i was letting her face often go a half stop brighter than key so it glowed a little bit but when i got in the final printing some of my printer lights were hitting the 40s which is pretty high you know normal is 25 and overexposed film should be printed in the mid 30s and i was printing in the low 40s which means i was pretty overexposed at times but the print was really rich you know the people who really responded to it are the ones who saw it in festivals because it's a direct contact print off the negative the color saturation the black level are all really unique something you can't get with digital projection other than now with laser projection you can get close to it but before digital projection just tended to be grayish in comparison so and of course we had to make a digital master Eventually, we made a color timed IP and then made a 2K master for home video and for digital theaters. But most people saw it in a print, so that was nice. You know, I know there's some DPs like Dan Mendel who still swear by using tungsten units. And I guess I'm curious, like, do you have a similar philosophy like that? Like, do you enjoy using like a 1K open face as your like base source to light people or have you gone full led and like just are using mostly modern units it depends i use a lot of leds on mazel it's all sort of soft lit and i'm blending it with practical lights and stuff when i can light tungsten i do generally think it looks nicer on faces and stuff if i you know all the midges stuff on doing our stage work was all the stages were always lit with tungsten because that's period correct and the follow spot was a tungsten follow spot that was tungsten and all our big sunlight effects, of course, for 20Ks and 10Ks and mole beams and stuff like that. So it's always some tungsten in the frame somewhere. And I'd like to occasionally do interiors with maxi brutes in, on location so I get like a sunset effect from a maxi brute out the window, things like that. I think that tungsten color on daylight balance has such a rich warmth to it that's different than just putting gel on an HMI or something like that. So there's something about the color of tungsten that's has more depth to it, I guess, in a way. The warmth has a depth to it that's different than LED. But it's just LEDs are so practical, and I do a lot of dimming. And I with tungsten, I'm always like, if I'm going to dim this tungsten light 70%, then all the tungsten has to be 70% to match that one and things like that. So it's, you start chasing your tail sometimes. It's a lot easier with LED these days. But I still think there's... Uh, if you're really critical about skin tones, I think you know your results are going to be very consistent with tungsten. With LED, you may be fixing it in post or tweaking it, trying to get it right. I, some LEDs have a certain magenta bias to them or they have a certain green bias to them and things like that. And if you mix them, you do spend some time in post windowing faces to get them to intercut. But tungsten is very consistent on, on that way. Yeah, and this might be more of just like a personal question of mine and who knows if it'll make it into the actual podcast but earlier you talked about lighting close-ups and faces and I I always think about Jennifer's body like there are some close-ups in that movie that are so gorgeous and like that is a era where you could maybe go either way like what did you use on that film yeah I mean maybe because it's a film film but it's still 500 speed Kodak at night and I think I used a the 200 speed in the daytime, I think. He's, back then, I tended to believe in the two-stock syndrome, like uh, either I do 
day stuff on 200 speed with an 85 and then pull it when I didn't need it and night at 500 or I do stage stuff on 250D and 500. There are a few shows where I'd use 50D. If it's a heavy day exterior show, things like that, then I'd use three stocks. But if I use 50D, I'd use 250D and then 500. So I, I had this sort of belief that cool tones are better on tungsten film and warm tones on daylight film. So if it's a desert-based movie, if I was going to New Mexico, I'm more prone to pick daylight balance stock. But in Jennifer's Body, I was going to Canada, and there's a lot of green trees and forests, and so I thought tungsten would be better. And if I pulled the 85, that's nice for the green trees and stuff. So it was all 200 speed and 500 speed. I rated, though the 500 speed at 320 when I could. I wanted a denser negative for the faster film. So some night stuff, I couldn't do that. But most of the night interiors, I could do 320 or 400, give it a little more density. That was in the time when I was using a lot of the really heavy white diffusion, heavier than 216, I think it was... Heavy frost? Yeah, so heavy frost, and I would key through that uh, for the actresses in the little bedrooms and stuff, you know, oh. usually like a 1K through a heavy frost frame or something like that. Um, that's so the, that that's was... the Dan Mendel thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a beautiful look, yeah. I, mean, I had a kind of general eye concept. One was that a lot of horror films have a kind of A to B arc where they start out one style and end up in another. So they start out in a naturalistic style of realism, and they end up in expressionism. So it becomes like this German expressionist world by the end where it's all moonlit and shadows or lightning or rain, but it starts out the other end where it's sunny and warm and happy. So that was sort of my idea with the movie was to have more warm tones, orange sunlight in the houses and the school, and then get rid of it as the movie went along and then end up in this creepy abandoned swimming pool with blue and cyan and light everywhere and so that's sort of knowing where we'd end up i started the opposite end basically some horror films are not like that they're horror from start to finish they're like a sleepy hollow film as kind of the same visual zone from the first frame to the last frame because they're creating or the movie seven you know there's creating a kind of although seven ends in a sunny field so it kind of does the flip of the typical arc but For most of Seven, it's this dreary, rainy, overcast world. And so, but my story, it started out in a normal reality and ended up in this stylized reality. So that was generally the arc of the film, excluding the the fact that it's a flashback structure. So it starts out at her in prison and escaping prison. And I wanted the prison scenes to be desaturated and grayish and cold. And then we go back to the past and it's warm and sunny until we get to the end. I guess one question I had just going off of the question about tungsten sources is I noticed a lot of breakdowns about the use of the mole beam on Maisel and maybe on other projects as well. But can you just talk a little bit about how you land on a unit like the mole beam and what about it appeals to you, um, maybe for a period specific film or just in general? Yeah, early on in my career, I really loved xenons. Even though at low budget films, I'd carry a 1K or 2K xenon on North Fork, we had a 6K Xenon in our package. It was a very small lighting package, but it was one 6K Xenon, one 6K HMI, and then some Kino flows and some smaller stuff. But I just really loved that beam of very sharp, focused light that would come to a window and create a parallel lines through the window like real sunlight does. I love using Leco's and Joe Leco's because they're kind of a miniature Xenon to me. You know, they get a similar effect, but in a smaller focused beam. So I'm always looking for lights that are hyper sharp like that, that create a kind of sunlight effect. And mole beams, even though they don't create a sharpest pattern on the ground because of the way they're designed, they do create a very strong, intense beam that's more uh, parallel and narrow than like a 10K at full spot. A 10K mole beam has a much more clearly defined beam of light than a 10K at full spot coming through a window. So uh, 10K Fresnel. So mole beams are very useful for that sunlight effect. That just, you know, I I grew up in the desert, so I'm very sensitive to what I feel looks like convincing sunlight with lighting units. You know, that's why I like using tungsten for warm afternoon light. And I'm very keen on the angle and the intensity and the way it bounces off the floor and stuff like that. Probably to the point where everything I shoot tends to look sunny. You know, I, when I did a smash here in New York, our AD had come off of Seasons of Law and Order where everything was New York overcast and he would come on the set and I've got mole beams doing slashes of sunlight in some New York apartment. He goes, 
what is this, Miami? You know, it's like, well, I'm from Southern California. To me, this is what an interior looks like. You know, it's just, uh, I have a lot more sunlight coming through windows than any New York apartment would ever have in actuality. So, and even on Maisel, we had probably more sunshine coming through windows than would really happen. But it's just, I grew up in the desert and I just have a certain affinity for hard sunlight, you know. Since we've been talking about films like The Love Witch that finish photochemically, and given that like your work spans both film dominant and digital dominant eras of cinematography, I guess something I'm very curious about is like in the current era in the digital dominant era, I've been wondering if DPs have lost some of the control over the image compared to what they had when the industry was film dominant. I guess my perception is that DPs, say like 20 or 30 years ago, were expected to finish their work through post-production, whereas now, like my own personal experience has been that DPs are often cut out of post-production and in order to maintain control over color, workflow, and quality, even on like narrative projects, it's always a battle. So I guess, has post-production always been like the most unexpectedly demanding and important part of our job? Or is what we're experiencing now something that's more complicated and difficult? Well, I think that the human element to all this is that we're only given as much control as the people in charge give us. So in the past, if there was a producer who wanted to take away a project from you and time it himself and it was film, he could do it. You know, he could ruin film photography. He could, you know, he couldn't change it so much and get away with it in a convincing way. Like at some point film just fell apart if you tried to really print it radically different. But they could do a lot of damage. They could make day for night look like day again. They could change warm to cold and cold to warm and things like that. But now with digital, there's this much more range of changes they could do that's out of your control. So it's really more a matter of, are you working with people that put you in control of that look or not? And if they don't want you there, then they probably were the person who wouldn't want you there 30 years ago either. It's just, so I don't think in a way the technology is the issue. It's just respect for the DP and their work. You know, I get hired for a certain look, so they expect me to carry it through post. It doesn't occur to them to get rid of me in post and do it themselves. They want me there. So I've never, for most part, not had the ability to finish what I start. I have been on a few projects where either I'm just a minor DP out of many DPs, and therefore there is no single vision, or I've been on shows where the showrunner after I've left to change their minds on what they think the show is. And I wasn't the only DP. I was like co-DP in a show. But it was a show that intercut two locations. I was a story that took place in the desert and a story took place in L.A. And I was trying to figure out what was the difference between L.A. and the desert. And I was trying to get more greens and blues in L.A. so that the warm orange in the desert would contrast. But at some point, someone at the network or someone said, let's just make everything yellow. So they re timed the whole show yellow from start to finish. And I saw it and I was like, I don't understand. What does this mean? You know, why make everything yellow? Why to make LA yellow? And it just, I suppose that you could say, well, golden California, you know, but it just, it didn't make sense from a narrative structurally point of view, but it wasn't particularly my show. So I didn't have a lot to say on that, but but other shows, uh, I, I've had line producers who I didn't shoot the bulk of the show, but still call me up for advice on how would you time this if this were your show? And I'd say, well, this is sort of my ideas, but you really should talk to the pilot DP because he's the one who started the look of the show because they had a vision when they did the pilot. You should go back to them. So, yeah. But it's all about control more than the technology. Now, of course, if you want to spend the money, which you can change the show quite a bit digitally, you could replace cast members, you could change locations. But that costs money and most shows are loath to spend a certain amount of money. So you're sort of protected to that degree that even if they wanted to change something, they look at the cost. Oh, it's going to take us $10,000 to get rid of that view out the window that I don't like. Well, well, it's fine then I'll leave it. So you're protected to some degree by at some point they got to go to air, they got to finish up. They don't have an extra 10 weeks to throw into post to, to make everything different again. So that's an aspect of it. But I, I do think ultimately it's all about the people you work with more than the technology. Either they they want your input in the look all the way through post 
And most of them understand that the look can be changed in post, so they want you involved. I occasionally do get into strange discussions. I remember when I did Astronaut Farmer, which was going to be finished in film. The last minute they did a DI. It was that period when DIs were just starting to come along. And at first they said there was no budget for DI. So, okay, I, I'll shoot it in anamorphic because I was suggesting we shoot it in Super 35 and the savings could be applied to the DI. And, and they said, but we won't budget for a DI. I said, fine, I'll shoot it in anamorphic then because it'll look better in the release print. And then they, the last minute they decided to do a DI. But... I remember talking to Warner Brothers at the time saying, I'd like to shoot this on Fujifilm because I'd shot all the Polish Brothers films on Fujifilm. It was kind of a good luck charm for me. And they said, that's fine as long as you're doing it for artistic reasons and not financial reasons to save us money or something. I said, no, no, it's completely artistic reason. I want to shoot Fujifilm. And I said, I want to print it on Fujifilm. They said, no, no, we pick the print stock. I go, what do you pick the print sauce on? Oh, on for financial reasons. Well, it's a negative positive system. You can't say the negative is artistic and the print is financial. It's, it only works together as a negative positive system. How the negative looks printed is what matters. And they said, no, we have a deal or 70% of our releases are on Kodak film and 30% are on Fuji film. And I go, well, which will I be? He goes, well, it depends on what time of year you come out and how much of the 70% deal we've used up and how much the 30% we got left. And so they couldn't say. So it didn't matter in the end because we ended up doing a DI and everything was calibrated to Vision print stock in the DI system and they ended up releasing it in Vision. So, But uh, it was just the strangest discussion I was having with post people saying, you know, it is a negative to positive system. No one looks at the negative. So it's crazy to say that the negative can be artistic, but the print is technical. It's all one thing. Wow. It's just an aspect in the digital realm that's similar. You know, when you get in discussions about LUTs and display gammas and all these sort of things, there's a technical reason for them and there's an artistic reason for them and they interact, but you have to sort of understand that to explain it to other people. Sometimes I think people put way too much emphasis on LUTs because primarily LUTs are there to correct gamma from log to linear, log to display gamma to Rec. 709 to P3. It always drives me crazy when I see these commercials like, this is how we save this footage, and they show some log scan, and then they show a Rec. 709 correction. They say, look, we took this ugly footage, and we made it rich and beautiful, and it's like, what? You just converted it from one display gamma to another display gamma, you know, it's, but there's somehow people think that the flatness in a log scan is a negative quality or something. And it's like, it's not meant to be looked at. It's not a negative. It's a positive in a sense. It's not a minus. It's a bonus that the origination has so much detail that you can play with. But it's easy to sell things when you say, look, with your special software, we can make your movie look cinematic. With a press of a button, we can have that teal and gold look everyone wants or whatever. So <laughs> I've never quite understood that. You know, yeah. so. It's so interesting because like hearing some of those anecdotes, I feel like at a certain point, having such a technical background is actually so important because it's like when you are trying to make the case for certain looks or for certain approaches, I think if you're very confident and you're very like studied on these things, that choice you're making or that thing that you're trying to sell through, whether it happens in post or on set, I think you just stick the landing so much more effortlessly when you have all of this background and hearing you talk about some of the stuff, a post of yours came to mind, which was the one I found this to be so fascinating, but it was the moonlight example in the desert where you shot moonlight at a 30 second exposure and then showed how crunching that down can achieve the look that we think of when we think of moonlight. And then by softening it and adding more stars in the sky, it furthered the way that it perceptually, that's how we experience it. Things are a little blurry and hard to see at night. And I just think showing that kind of pipeline but then not necessarily presenting that to, say, a director or, you know, when you're in post or something, but just knowing yourself as a cinematographer that those are kind of the steps to get to that final product. The way that you illustrated that and lay that out just what I thought was very, very interesting. And I think it shows, obviously, in so much of your work that there's all of this technical knowledge and then it's being filtered through. And the end result actually is more about the emotion and more about the way that it feels or the way that it lends itself to the script. Yeah, I mean, everything about filmmaking is perceptual. So when people say, well, it's not really sharp, it just feels sharp. Well, if it feels sharp, it is sharp. It's, it, all that matters is how you perceive the final image. How you got there can really vary person to person, but 
if people perceive something as soft or sharp or rich or whatever, that's a valid reaction. It's, it, whether or not it's scientific or not doesn't matter, ultimately. If that's the reaction, it's a true reaction. So you have to work with people's feelings about things. I, it was very technical, but I, I was rereading this book on the creation of color negative film at Kodak. And they, at the time in the 40s, this during World War II, they tested this color negative film they developed, and they felt it was pretty sharp according to their test. They zoomed in on the grains, and they took test charts. So they took it into the theater at Kodak in Rochester to show the employees that show movies. Every lunchtime, they would show a movie. So it said, look, we're going to show you a test reel of this new color negative product. So they made a color print, they projected it, and everyone in the audience kept shouting, focus, and they go, it is in focus, no. So they go, I don't understand, our test showed that it's sharp, but everyone's perception in the theater was it's out of focus. So they, they realized that it wasn't good enough, they had to go back to the drawing board and figure out where to gain more sharpness out of the process. But they also said, we need a better way to measure sharpness. Clearly, the way we're doing it is not accurate. So they actually hired an engineer on the side to say, come up with a new system to measure sharpness in film. And he invented the MTF curve system. He said, it's just like what you're looking at is contrast, modulation, all these things. He developed a scientific way to judge resolution and sharpness. But before that, it was just kind of an eyeball system where they would just shoot charts and they would look at them and zoom in on a microscope and look at those, that and say, oh, you know, it should be sharp. But uh, they really didn't understand the science of that. So again, people perceive something, then their perceptions are true. You can't fault them for that. That's the way the audience reacts, and that's you have to take into account. I think that's an interesting segue into this question about the cinematography textbook, because I think what we're touching on is some of these foundational aspects, just some of the things that are at its most basic level, you know, what is sharpness, what is a lot, what is gamma. And I think that I found this textbook to be so helpful just as a way to sort of go back to the very fundamental of cinematography. And could you just talk a little bit about what it's been like to be a co-editor of the most recent edition and what that's meant to you? You know, I worked on two books. One is the cinematography and the other is the ASC manual. Now, the ASC manual just came out two years ago, whereas the cinematography textbook came out, I want to say, 15 years ago. So it's not that recent. Um, And it was the third edition. The original edition came out in the mid-70s. Then the next edition came out in the mid-80s, which is the one I used in film school. So when Chris was planning his third edition in the early 2000s, he said, at this point, I don't feel I'm up to speed on what the current trends are. So he asked me to come in and do the rewrite on the book. What was odd about it is that the chapters that needed the most revision were areas that I'm not an expert in. There was sound recording on film, and there was a lot of post stuff had changed the most. The stuff about lenses and film stocks and all had changed less. But I had, So a lot of the research I had to do was about areas I didn't really have a handle on, which like, what is the most common sound recording formats being used on independent films and things like that. Uh, but it was good to also, I, you know, rework some of the wording and the structure of the original chapters on lenses and film stocks and just to make sure it flowed clearly. But it was fun to write a textbook because you think you can structure it like, oh, I'm going to start with light and optics, and then I'll go to film stocks, and then I go to cameras. So, no, I, I got to cover cameras before I get to film stocks. And you keep rearranging chapters because it, it's just like, what is the natural, you know, there should be a flow from pre-production to post-production. Well, okay, lab work clearly is later, right? Except you shoot your negative and you develop it right away. So maybe I should cover that earlier. I kept rearranging whole sections of the book to something that felt like a flow. And the same with the ASC manual too. But it generally flows from shooting to post-production. But there's so much overlap that it's very hard to uh, be consistent about that. But it's great to write articles or write textbooks because you have to do research and learn it yourself. To exp- it's like teaching in general. To teach something, you have to learn it. So you teach yourself. You make sure you're being accurate about something. You relook up things. And there are stories I've told over the years that I've, when I went back and found my sources, I found that I've been telling it wrong, you know, and I I used to tell the story about Jack Cardiff shooting under Capricorn and how it was the first time they transitioned Technicolor from Daylight Bounce to Tungsten Bounce. And Ingrid Bergman had this big, long dialogue scene, and she was complaining that they always had to loop her stuff because the noise of the carbon arc lights would cause them to have to loop her dialogue, and she didn't want to loop the scene. And Jack Cardiff 
lit it for tungsten. He said, no, we're tungsten bounce. And when they shot the scene, they could hear the camera now over the quieter lights. So they, she still ended up looping the scene. But when I reread the story, I found out, no, they hadn't switched to tungsten yet because that happened in 1952 with Roy Wagner told me it happened with uh, Greatest Show on Earth, the circus film, and Under Capricorn was like 1949 or something. So I went back to that story and I checked it, and it turned out it wasn't that the Technicolor camera had switched to tungsten balance, it's that he lit the scene with tungsten lights with blue gel on them. Basically he said, oh, I, the arcs are too noisy, I'm going to bring in all these 10Ks, put blue gel, I'll have barely enough light to shoot by on three strip, but... We'll shoot it with tungsten lights only, and you won't have any carbon arc noise. And that's when they found out that they could hear the cameras now over the quieter lights. So the result was the same. But I'd been misremembering that story for years until I went back and reread it. And it happens all the time. I've read so many books over the years that 30 years later, I say, where did I read that? You know, like the use of flashing on Camelot by Richard Klein. And I knew Richard Klein, the ASC. I went back to my issue of American Cinematographer, and there's no mention of flashing and I go, I know this film was flashed. It, he talked about flashing the film and rewinding the film in the morning and flashing it. Where, and I went through every book on my bookshelf. And I finally, I found it in Chris Malkiewicz's film lighting book, talking about post-work and shooting. There was a little paragraph by Richard Klein saying on Camelot, every morning my camera assistant would shoot a gray card, rewind the film, and we'd expose the film to a gray card and flash it that way. And then I was like, okay, that's why I read that. But I couldn't remember where I'd seen that. So... Every now and then I have to reread everything I've read <laughs> before, you know. We need to create a David Mullen large language model um, <laughs> to index all this knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. Sometimes I look up something online and I find out that I had the answer 10 years ago. Like, what is this? And I type in a question on the Google it and I come in like, David <laughs> Mullen said in 2003. And I go, oh, he knew the answer. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, that's a very strange experience. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, that's funny. There was a question I had early on about like yeah, the internet's changed. That, over the time. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we passed over it, but that's funny that you came back to it. Yeah. Cause I started on CML when it was Usenet. I, there was no Facebook and there was just Usenet groups and web forums. And then that's now evolved into Facebook as a web forum and, and podcasts and other means of information. So yeah, yeah. it's uh, it keeps changing. Would you, I guess, because we're sort of talking about books too, um, would you tell us more about the new filter book that you're working on? The book is very in the preliminary stage. So it's uh, Ryan Avery's asked me and Roy Wagner and Ira Tiffin and Marty Olstein to contribute to this book on filters history. I think it's just diffusion filters, but the history and current trends and all these other things. So we're all pitching in in various aspects of the hire is the real expert because he's actually designed these filters but Roy and I have been looking into the period filters from the 30s and 40s Roy has a big collection and I've been looking at those and testing some of those and stuff like that which is a lot of fun because it explains why certain 30s films look the way they do when you see some of these filters yeah I found that like the macro photography is really insightful you know because then you're kind of understanding, like there's one about sandblasting. Yeah, black dot texture screens from Harrison. Yeah, they sandblasted the filter and then filled in the broken bits with a kind of gray dye so they would darken. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting idea for a filter. Right, right. It just, I think that I was connecting the dots a lot between like what I'd seen in Boca and then how that was reflected in the actual making of the filter. And that's something I think I had maybe thought about, but I had not really made that connection fully that I was literally seeing the pieces of refraction mm -hmm. or whatever they were doing on the glass. And that's why it's like different in each filter. Yeah. You know, bokeh, like behind me, you could see some bokeh there. I don't have any glass on, but there's some probably dust on the glass that's causing the little breakup in the bokeh there. But mm -hmm. anything you have in a filter is going to show up in the bokeh either choices to shoot clean or to or in diffuse and post or the filters that use the really fine grain sort of material like limer glass and thing can at least be less distracting than the ones that use bigger patterns in them you know mm -hmm. yeah it's fantastic 
David, um, thank you so, so much for your time and for coming on our show. Uh, this is just such an incredible wealth of knowledge and your wisdom is just so invaluable. We are so excited to keep watching the work and congratulations again on the Emmy win. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. Sure. It was great fun. It's nice seeing you guys. Thank you, David. Thank you. This episode of the Cinematography Salon podcast was produced by Peter Pascucci, Ava Benjamin Shore, and David Kruta, with original music by One Wave and edited by Corey Abel. We created this episode in partnership with the Cinematography Salon, and we would like to extend a special thanks to the Salon community for supporting our efforts with this show. We'd also like to extend our gratitude to Able Cine for their continued support. If you're unfamiliar with their offerings, Able Cine provides services such as equipment rentals, sales, maintenance, training, and much more. Additionally, they host complimentary events at their various locations. For more details, please visit ablecine.com. If you enjoyed listening to the show, we encourage you to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes and news. Thanks.